Bob Myers officially out in Golden State. The Phoenix Suns fans, Golden Boy is available on today's episode of Locked on Suns. Is he coming? Let's go. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. We're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons, a writer at suns.com and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on this Wednesday. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. So hit follow or subscribe to get this show in your feed every single Monday through Friday for the rest of the offseason and beyond. Become an everyday or get locked onto your favorite team each and every day with all the analysis and news that you could ever need. You can also give me a comment on this YouTube video down below with your thoughts on whether Bob Myers would come. You can at me at Locked On PHX Suns over on Twitter with your thoughts there as well to get involved and connected to this community. Today's show, guys, brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment vo- more by visiting FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Bob Myers of the Golden State Warriors, the longtime GM and, pres- and then president of basketball operations. Finally, long expected news that he would not be staying with Golden State. That became official on Tuesday. The press conference happened and everything else. So the architect of the dynasty that defined this era of the NBA is leaving said dynasty, leaving said organization, and we don't know where he's headed next. Now, at the press conference, Myers not only announced that he was leaving and fueling speculation of where he might end up next, but in a uh, soundbite, viral soundbite that understandably got Suns fans' attention, Myers referenced uh, a conversation with Kevin Durant on Tuesday after the news came out and took a moment to give particular Um, not particular, not any more or less than anybody else, but went out of his way to thank and remember and look back on the time that Durant spent with the Warriors. And I believe it actually also came up from Joe Lacob, the managing partner or governor of the team, that Bob Myers was the one who went out and basically had the idea and the structure in place to go get Durant and enter that sweepstakes. And so, In a bizarre turn of events, a guy that the Suns, I I think Suns fans, have already been fantasizing about in the form of Bob Myers, became available and somehow it roped in a player in specific terms who's already on the Suns and obviously uh, one of their best players in Kevin Durant. So it felt like a good time for me to address this again. I I think last week I did a 10 or so minutes on it at the end of a show just because it's been out there and, and I had a feeling we might be getting some news on it soon. My feelings are still the same, but I have some clarity that I think I can provide for you as well. My feelings are the same in that I think that Bob Myers is the type of guy who, if you read even the, frankly, uh, insane article that Adrian Wojnarowski wrote announcing and breaking the news that Myers was leaving the Warriors, um... I think Woj overdid it, but he basically said he's going to be one of the most sought-after executives in modern American pro sports history. Just in good grief. But also, the second paragraph of that section where he just pumped up Bob Myers, I do feel like had some kernels of truth in it, which is that Myers is somebody who you would imagine only goes to a new destination or whatever job he takes next is most likely to be a larger set of responsibilities. And Myers said at his press conference today, it's not really about money. I would imagine that the Warriors are the type of team that would offer Myers just about more than he could get anywhere else. I would imagine that the biggest point of the two biggest things that probably led Bob Myers to leave would be one, the 
uncertainty around the future of that organization from a roster standpoint. You know, as long as you have Curry, you're going to have a chance. You're going to have the talent and you're going to be one of the teams. But, you know, how much longer is Curry's career, realistically speaking? You know, if you're looking five, 10 years down the road, which Myers is 48, so he still has a long career in front of him. And then around Curry, there's not a lot of certainty. You don't know what Clay Thompson's even going to be, let alone how much longer he will be there. Draymond Green, the same way. And young talent wise, there's obviously a bunch of question marks. They just traded a former top pick. So I think that's one. I think the other one is just the question of what type of power he was reasonably going to have. And the fact that, you know, even if he was able to maintain his voice in the organization, which I don't, as a person living in Phoenix who doesn't have any idea what's going on at Golden State, I have no way of, of saying, but I definitely think we can tell from the outside looking in that there was not exactly a path to more power with the Warriors, right? I mean, there's already rumors about uh, Lake of Sun, who has slowly risen up from running the G League operation to being more of a voice in the basketball operations. And, you know, it's not exactly hard to, to follow that pattern. That tends to be what these guys do. They want their family to have a say. They personally want to have a say. And so if you're not in the type of organization where you're going to be able to accumulate more and more influence and wealth and whatever, then there's only so much further that you're really going to go, especially when you're a guy like Myers who's accomplished so much. So any team that's going to get Bob Myers, and maybe what Woj was alluding to in that report is that Myers might be looking outside of the NBA. I don't know. I don't personally feel like building a dynasty in the NBA makes you qualified to do much else besides doing that, but so be it. The NBA is getting bigger. Maybe that will change. But you could see that he might want more, right? To be a president of a team, period. Not just the president of basketball operations. What Woj also had in there was ownership. I don't really know what team he could realistically buy his way into. Again, he's not that wealthy. He's not all that old to have accumulated much of that. I, I don't know, but that's the type of thing that a team would have to offer, right? If it's not really going to be about money, he's already had success. Well, then what else is there? It's sort of influence, power, um, the ability to really have control of something. And I just don't think the Suns could offer him that. They've already hired a new CEO, a very young new CEO, not unlike Bob Myers, actually. Um, and unless they really make a sudden move to fire their general manager now in, in James Jones, who's, I guess he's their president of basketball operations. I just don't see a real pathway for them to do this. And obviously, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they could go ahead and fire James Jones. I'm not trying to dismiss that out of hand. I, I guess what I would say is we'll know very, very soon. And I think we would have already heard something, you know, if, if, if Bob Myers was going to go somewhere else, I think it would have been in motion and we would know it already. And while I do think Matt Ishbia and maybe let's say Devin Booker and Kevin Durant have just as much say in this head coaching search as James Jones probably does, I would also just say that going through an entire coaching search if you have in the back of your mind that you might also be replacing your lead decision maker on the basketball operations side would just be setting yourself up for negativity, uh, for problems. Let me say that, not negativity, just bad outcomes. It's not good when a great, uh, you know, a GM or executive is brought in and then did not pick the head coach. Typically, you're setting yourself up to have to hire a new coach and you're just doing it wrong. Now, maybe doing it wrong is worth it for Bob Myers. Maybe Myers was just trying to be respectful to the Warriors and let that situation play out before he went public or really pursued anything new. Maybe there is more to the Bartlestein having formerly been an agent and Myers having formerly been an agent. Maybe those two guys might actually be simpatico and, and it might appeal to Ishbia to pair them together at the top of this organization. There are all sorts of ways that it can go. And I do think the fact that Durant is close with him matters. But it's also interesting to me that people would buy into so quickly the idea that Durant has that much say here already. I'm not saying you don't listen to Kevin Durant when he's on your team, but the idea that you know he would have a close enough relationship with Ishbia or Jones or anybody like that to have sway and somebody that he likes be vaulted up to the top of something like that and result in firings and all this stuff. Like I'm not even of the opinion personally that what Durant wanted had anything to do with 
why Matt, why Wani Williams was fired. That's been getting thrown around. Oh, Coach Killer, Durant got Monty fired. No, I think Matt Ishbia made that decision. I think his lack of faith in Monty is why Monty's not the coach here first and foremost. Not Durant, not any of that. And so if you believe Bob Myers is a realistic candidate here, I don't think it comes from Durant. I don't think whatever was said about Durant at that press conference should be the reason you believe it. If you think Myers is a realistic candidate, the the, the point and the, the way that that happens is that the Suns are willing to go scorched earth, do things out of order, and fire somebody who for a month now, has already been overseeing what this offseason may entail in the form of James Jones just to go out and get Bob Myers. I'm not here to tell you that that's wrong. I'm not here to tell you that Bob Myers would not be an upgrade over James Jones. I personally think a lot of us just don't really know with this stuff. But that's what would have to happen. And that's why I don't think it's likely. Because the Suns can't really offer more responsibility unless they just completely undo the whole shape and structure of everything in place. And I just don't know if June 1st or whatever it might be with a head coach already in place is really the right timing to do that. Let's jump back to basketball. The four conference finalists, I think, can teach us multiple things about the Suns, starting with the team that beat them and the man at the center of that team, Nikola Jokic. We'll talk about him and what the Suns may need to do to respond to his dominance next first today's show. Once again, brought to you by FanDuel and the FanDuel Sportsbook. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs, the NBA Finals now, because right now new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you place a bet at FanDuel. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. I think I said $1,000 first. They have upped it to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. They have NBA Finals odds already. Game one minus nine in favor of the Denver Nuggets. I think that line has already moved from minus seven and a half all the way to minus nine. Denver with a week of rest and Miami coming off of a Terrible, uh, terrifying, painful seven-game series against the Boston Celtics. I think it's safe to say the Nuggets should be favored by a considerable margin there, but they'll have finals odds and everything. WNBA odds every day if you are looking to get your hoops fixed. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of the NBA. Nikola Jokic took it to the Suns for six games. We all watched it. I'm not going to belabor what that series was was like, you all remember it. It was not fun. However, I do think that there is still something to learn from that series, but also just what may be now the Nikola Nikola Jokic era of the NBA between his two MVPs and now his first appearance in the NBA Finals and, and, you know, him being favored to dominate these finals, get a championship and finals MVP and, and everything that comes with that. If this is a new era for the league where I think parity will be bigger or more widespread, whatever you want to say there, there will be uh, more variability in who makes the finals every year. There will not necessarily be one juggernaut, but you know, an individual like Jokic who makes his teammates better and is so dominant in so many ways is the guy that you may need to answer to in the Western Conference, and he's a center. The past three MVPs, if you want to include Giannis, who the Suns also have now lost to, have all been basically seven-footers who demand that you match their size with size on your end. I think that there is something to be learned there, and I think that Jokic is the starting point. Now, I think the place to start is the DeAndre Ayton sweepstakes or the DeAndre Ayton problem that the Suns have on their hands in terms of finding the right trade, not jumping the gun on a trade, just how do you approach that situation where you have a player who has not live up to ex- lived up to expectations for you, makes a lot of money, and 
has an unknown number of suitors around the league. Coupled with the fact that you are now facing down the prospect of needing to have answers for Nikola Jokic every season. You have to go into every season if you are the Suns expecting and believing and preparing for the fact that you may need that you will need to beat Nikola Jokic to win a title. Right? And so I don't necessarily think that that should hold you back from from keeping DeAndre Ayton or from I'm sorry, hold you back from trading DeAndre Ayton because we just had a, you know, we just watched him have an opportunity to prove himself against Jokic and quite frankly he did not. I also don't I'm not of the opinion there's so many ways to approach roster building, there's so many different pathways. The Suns are going to probably be making two trades this offseason between Ayton and Chris Paul, so the idea that you have to get a center back in an Ayton trade, I don't really believe. But I don't think it's realistic necessarily to approach the center spot in the way that maybe last offseason when we were talking about sign-in trades with Ayton or possible replacements for Ayton. You know, I think there was a lot of like, well, if Chris Paul is still going to be one of your better players and you have Bridges and, and Johnson and at that time we thought Jay Crowder was still going to be here and, and these wings, well, then maybe you can pivot to a more versatile switching, you know, length and finesse type of defense where you don't need a big groundbound, you know, physical center. I mean, groundbound, I, I shouldn't necessarily say, but you don't need a traditional center. I think you do need at least one now, but I also think the way that the roster has evolved aside from Aiton and aside from the center spot is also important here. Kevin Durant, as we have watched the best defense against Jokic in these playoffs, Durant is the type of piece that should make you feel good about your ability as a team defense to have a shot against Jokic. And what I mean by that is whether you look at, you know, the way that the double big look by Minnesota at times had some success against Jokic, the ways in which during the regular season, guys like Embiid or um, Pirtle as helpers with guys like Tucker and OG Ananobi in the post defending him. And then obviously the Lakers with Rui guarding him or LeBron in the post on Jokic and, and Davis as a roamer. All of these different pathways. Durant can be that roaming helper defender who helps you contest at the basket, send help, and all of those things. But you need somebody in the post. And the Suns don't have a P.J. Tucker or a Rui Hachimura. Maybe T.J. Warren can be that for you in spurts, but unless he recovers really, really well from that injury and, and proves himself to be a consistent, reliable defender in the NBA, which he still has never done, you're not going to go forward and say TJ is our guy doing that. That's silly. He can be an option. He can be something in your back pocket. You want to have that if you're going to resign him as a thing you explore, but you have to have size in the interior. And so, yes, like there are plenty of trade options and we've talked about some of those already. You know, I I just think it's a little bit of a guessing game right now to just go through, well, what about this center? Like, sure, you know, I guess we could do that. But I'm going to more uh, realistically look at free agents and guys who the Suns could get at a cheap price tag who I think they could, they could and should consider. Number one is Brooke Lopez. He's made a lot of money. If he's really willing to take a, a significant discount and, and go someplace like Phoenix, he's a perfect answer. I think that he is somebody very similar to Al Horford who can do just enough at his size, even though he's in an advanced age in the NBA at 35. I could see him continuing to make an impact in the playoffs for two, three more seasons. He's probably the most desirable center free agent that there is. But there's also guys like Mason Plumley. I think keeping Jock Landale is not a bad idea. I mean, this is a guy who is 28, but is by no means like, 
I think, a finished NBA product just because the more time that he's gotten in Phoenix throughout the season, he always seems to have lived up to that, you know? Um, I would start to worry if you go much deeper than that with these free agents. But, you know, even somebody like, let's say, Billy Hernan Gomez, which I think is how you say uh, his name, or uh, there was just a... a uh, free agent. Oh, Yusuf Nurkic is not a free agent, but he's a, a trade candidate for sure in Portland. Like, can you get away with having these guys on the court for 15 to 20 minutes? And can you combine that with some other options like maybe a TJ Warren or a different type of center that you maybe keep with Jock Landell in the mix as well, potentially, and then having Durant there as a helper, having some maybe some players who you feel better switching with. You want to have variety. You don't want to build your whole roster around stopping Nikola Jokic, but you can't ignore it. We'll see what he does in the finals, but he's already proven that he is a capable and dominant playoff player, somebody that can single-handedly will a team over the line and is going to make his team a championship contender if they are healthy every single year. You cannot ignore that. On the Eastern Conference side, I want to talk about what the Celtics' wings, what they're good at, what they're bad at, where their limitations are, actually tells us about Devin Booker. We'll do that after a quick break. A lot of talk coming off of Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals about Jason Tatum, about Jalen Brown, and what both of them can and cannot do at this point in their careers. Now, Tatum's only 25 Jalen, I believe, is about to turn 27. They are not finished products. Neither is Devin Booker. I'm not even so much interested in the debate about is Booker better than Tatum or vice versa. I think the fact that it's even a conversation now speaks to how brilliant Booker was this regular season and then obviously even uh, greater in the playoffs. But I don't really care about who's better. The point is, both of them, I think, are good enough to be championship number ones. And I think that Booker's game has some of the things that make him more ready and more um, effective in the playoffs than maybe Tatum is on a consistent basis. And I think that if you're going to make the argument that he's better, if you're going to make the argument about what he's better at, I should say, it's going to start there. Booker has a game where the starting point of his style and his approach, the start of it is the stuff that is supposed to be the hardest to do. The stuff that you need to put, to take yourself to that next level. The stuff that Tatum and Brown both don't have still. You know, I think that what Brown struggles with from a, Uh, passing and ball handling perspective Booker is significantly beyond that but I also do want to be you know realistic and reasonable and say like okay Booker's ball handling is maybe one of the knocks on his game as well but it's far and away better than what Jalen Brown is doing so he has the ability that let's stick with Brown that Brown doesn't have to find solutions when maybe the defense is keyed into him. But I think Tatum is the more interesting one because it's really all about the ability to use the gravity that they both draw to them as creators. Booker has become masterful, and I think a big reason why he took a step forward this year is that he's intentionally seeking out that defensive attention, manipulating it, and then using it to create for his teammates in a way that Tatum struggles to even do step one of that, which is to, you know, draw that defense and make even a simple pass, let alone intentionally pull those guys out to make space for teammates. Tatum's not there. The other part that Tatum, that limits Tatum in the highest pressure moments that maybe limits him from beating defenses in big-time playoff spots repeatedly, consistently, 
is that he does not have that in-between game as a scorer that Booker has always had. And so some of the stuff that Booker had to do when he was a young player, playing point guard more, having the ball in his hands, combined with the shot diet that he has sought out from the beginning, which is mid-range first, everything else from there, has just made him into a player who was automatically and, and from the jump ready for the playoffs. We've never really had to wonder if Devin Booker could score in the postseason. The first time he ever got a chance, he was knocking out you know, the Lakers in, in that game six with a huge scoring performance. He was doing uh, really impressive things with Chris Paul out of the lineup to open up the Western Conference Finals. And then he had two 40 pieces in the Finals. And then he follows that up with a huge game against the Pelicans. And then in this year's playoffs, a just, I mean, an all-time run. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And so there has never been a moment where we wondered, could Booker score? And then I think this year, what he answered is that as a creator for others and as a passer and, and just an overall manipulator of a playoff defense, he doesn't seem to have a lot of questions remaining as to whether he can do that. And there's really not a lot of holes left in what he's going to be able to do as an offensive player in the playoffs. That is such like that you can't overstate that. There's no way to to over overdo or overemphasize how big that is for this team. I mean, they are going to go setting aside Kevin Durant who also you would say a lot of those same things about. It's the reason you go get him. But Booker as a guy who can handle the ball, which I don't think you want to do with Durant. The Suns just have a guy where after this playoff run, you're coming off of it saying, we can put the ball in Book's hands and we'll be good. And like, yes, you probably need more ball handling than he had after Chris Paul got hurt in game two. You probably need better shooting to give him space so that he's not having to do so, so, so much. But even with that said, an inconsistent and then injured Chris Paul, the Suns still got six playoff wins and took more games from the potential eventual champion here in the Denver Nuggets than anybody has. I think it's going to be Nuggets in five in the finals. It doesn't really matter here or there whether they took more games or not, but it could end up being that way, all with the limitations of the rest of this Phoenix roster. Celtics fans right now are worried if their tandem offensively is going to be able to grow into something that can beat playoff defenses for four rounds every year. The Suns don't have to wonder. They've seen it. The other stuff is what the Suns need to figure out. And it's the running theme of this show. I've talked about it from a lot of different angles now. But that advantage is just irreplaceable. It puts the Suns in the upper echelon of contenders on an annual basis until Durant leaves or gets to the physical end of what he's able to do in the NBA. Or um, I guess that's it. I mean, unless somebody wants to get traded or something crazy, which there's no point in speculating on. That's how the Suns have positioned themselves with the guys that they have on this roster and the steps forward that Booker has taken. There's not a lot of other teams that can say that, including the one who made the finals last year in the East and came within, you know, one win of doing it again this year. The Suns have more confidence in their best guys doing what needs to be done than that team. How do you not feel good about that? That'll wrap us up for today. Hoping to get a Deep dive on the salary cap in before the end of the week, as well as Aaron Edwards returning as he does midweek each and every week here on Locked on Sun. So hit follow and subscribe wherever you're finding this show to get it in your feed every day, become an everydayer alongside the thousands of people who listen just like you. And in the meantime, listen to Locked on Sports today. Catch that show wherever you get podcasts to get filled in on everything going on around the world of sports. They are great. They are there for you. And I will catch you tomorrow.